How many's hungry? <laughs> How many wants some coffee tonight? Thank you, Brother Bob. He brought me a, a pound of Colombian coffee from Colombia, South America. It's, they make good coffee down there. Uh, especially the higher you get up in the altitudes, the better the coffee is. But I uh, got some good coffee, so I'm going to try some tomorrow. I'll let you know how it is. Amen. All right, Psalm chapter 66. I've enjoyed going through the book of Psalms. Uh, this is another one of these Psalms. Let's just, let's just read uh, the first two verses, and then let's go down to the last two verses real quick. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of His name. Make His praise glorious. Now look down to verse number 19. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God which hath not turned away my prayer, nor His mercy from me. We find these two verses, and, and we're going to tie them together a little bit. Uh, but you find the explanation of them actually in the middle of the psalm. A lot of times Psalms does that. Uh, psalms will give you a beginning and then it'll give you an end. And then in the middle it'll explain why those two are situated the way they are. So I enjoy them tonight. Uh, but it's written to the chief musician, uh, a song or a psalm. So this was another one of those set to music, all right? It was made to have music with it. Sometimes we sing Al Capulco, all right? A cappella with no music, and, and that's good. Uh, old Hard Shell Baptist, where we come from, they'll take a pipe, it's a pitch pipe, and they will blow a certain key to get them started. And boy, let me tell you, they can sing. Uh, they got some issues, but uh, they can sing. And they'll sing a cappella. They don't believe in using uh, all these electronics, and, it let, <laughs> and yet they're... Uh, recording the service, all right? So I, I'll leave that between them and the Lord. But we find it's one of them that needs to be sung. I love Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in, in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation. You remember that one? Ah, well, I, I like these, all right? So what we're going to look at to the chief musician, he, the author of the psalm, once again, here is not named. A lot of times they name them. A lot of them are Davidic or a lot of them by the sons of Korah or whoever. to tell you who wrote the psalm. But when it doesn't name it, you need to understand it's meant more for you and more for me. That everybody can put themselves in this place. So it's giving God praise and it, it's an individual act. Uh, I've, uh, I've often told people I don't want somebody praising God for me. I, c I can do my own praising God. Amen. Uh, I, I just I enjoy that and I hope you do too. But uh, we don't run up and down the aisles and we don't uh, swing from the chandeliers. Uh, we had somebody visit for a while not long ago and every time I turn around he's telling me how great the two pastors were that he had. And uh, they were there, and they're good preachers, all right. But you know, they preach all over the pulpit, all over the front of the auditorium. And boy, he, he liked that. And then he told me how good their choirs were. He said, boy, they travel around to camp meetings and other things, boy, and they sing and they stir the hearts of the people. And then he told me how spiritual the congregations were. They shout and praise God and everything. And what he was doing, he was letting us know that we're a little bit under par. Amen. <laughs> And all the time he's here, I never heard him say amen. He never said, let me sing in the choir and help make a difference up in the choir and all these things. And I, I thought to myself, you have come to be entertained. Now, we're not talking about entertainment here. We're talking about the author praising the Lord. I believe that praise of God is a requirement for every child of God and you can praise God in whatever manner you want. I've seen people better felt and tell just cry. You see people handle things in different ways. Well, we find he opens this up. Let's just look, make a joyful noise unto God. Now, you say, I can't sing. You tell God about that. Amen. He said, make a joyful noise. We all, hey, any, we can all make a noise. <laughs> 
Amen. Just, just squeak. Uh, if you don't know what to say, like Tommy Holbrook said when he first started preaching, he didn't know what to say, amen. And he just right in the middle of the service hollered out, hot dog. <laughs> you know, I, well, it fit in there pretty good. Everybody liked that. So we're talking about making a joyful noise, all ye lands. But look at verse 2. Sing forth the honor of his name and make his praise. What you give to him needs to be glorious in its nature. Now, what's he talking about glorious in its nature? He's not talking about articulation. Uh, he's not talking about you being a great orator in front of God. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that the praise that you give God glorifies God, not self. We don't do things to be seen. We're not here to be seen. But we are here for God to hear us tonight. So I want to break this down just a little bit. He actually broke I broke it down in two or three uh, different perspectives. One, a right perspective, psalm of joy, but thank God for that. But in verses number three through seven, we find remembrance. What causes you and I to praise God? Look in verse number three through seven. Say unto God, not to me now, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Come and see the works of God. He's terrible in his doing toward the children of men. Look at verse 6. He brings back one of the greatest miracles that is found in the Bible in verse number 6. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in Him. Now when he's talking about this, you need to understand the psalmist wasn't there. This psalm was written at about 1000 A.D. That's in the time of David when this psalm was actually written. If you go back uh, to when they came out of Egypt, they came out of Egypt uh, about two, three hundred years before. So this man, but what he's doing, he's personalizing something. But what he's saying is, you need to remember something. What causes us to praise? When we remember back at what God has done for us. I thought about power over his enemies. He said that in verse number three. He said, through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. We've got a lot of enemies tonight. Uh, they don't, a lot of them don't even know they are enemies. They have no concept that when, what they're, when they're fighting against God, they fight against the church. They fight against the people of God. I've often told people, don't ever let somebody's sin come between them and you. If you let it come in between them and you, they'll attack you. But if you keep their sin between them and God, they're going to have to deal with God. So we find here the the power over his enemies. Over in Isaiah 59, he said this, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising sun. When the enemy shall come like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. We face a lot of difficult things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight. You've got difficulties. I've got them. The wickeder people get, the more they reject. Christianity. Talking about the things of God. Uh, they don't want to hear it. They, they, they don't want to be around it anymore. They, uh, they come in, we have a lot of first time visitors, you know, they come in, drop in one service. Hey, I, I thank God I'm such a good preacher that they get enough preaching, they don't ever have to come back and get any more. I, hey, that's a positive way to look at it, right? But he's talking about power over enemies. And then in verse 6, the power of deliverance. I want to read something out of Psalms 106. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. Why did God do what he did in Egypt? Listen, God could have brought them out in a different way. God had, could have taken them through the desert in a lot easier way. If you come out of Egypt and you go up around underneath the Mediterranean Sea, they call that the way of the kings or the way of the sea. 
It takes about 11 to 13 days for you to get from Egypt to Canaan by just simply going around up there. There's water there. You find water, you find wells, you find everything else. And yet he took them right across the top of the Sinai Peninsula all the way over to the Arabian Peninsula where Mount Sinai actually was. Paul in the book of Galatians talked about Mount Sinai in Arabia. That's where Sinai was. You look at traditional Sinai down there, nobody would ever take a flock of sheep down there because there's no water, there's no food. That's the most arid place in the world. There's no way that Moses would have taken his sheep out of Midian, which is on the east side of Aquaba, and come around the top of Aquaba and come down to Mount Sinai where you couldn't feed or water those things. If you look up the, tr the two Sinai's, you say, well, why do they call that? That was named Mount Sinai by the Roman Catholic Church in about 400 uh, uh, A.D. They named that Mount Sinai down there, traditional. But hey, we're talking about he brought them the, the long way around. The power of deliverance. Listen to what he said. He rebuked the Red Sea also and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths, as through the wilderness, and he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemy, and there was none of them left. So he cites one of the greatest things that has ever happened. Now I'm talking about praise. Why? We've got a God. If he can do that, and he did. Don't think you've got a task that's too, too large for him. Don't think you've got something that you're facing that God cannot handle. That friend, if he did what he did, and he did what he did. So we find the remembrance as he looks back. Now, verses 18 through 12, I call this reflection. We remembered in old. But if you look in verse number 8, O oh, bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. One which holdeth our soul in life. Holdeth our soul in life. That's an interesting verse. Over in Hebrews chapter number 10, the Bible said, but we're not of them who draw back under perdition. You've got some people say they get saved, but then they go back under perdition. They never really got saved. They didn't believe under salvation. That's why he said that the dog and the hog are both returned to their vomit and they're washing and wallowing in the mire. What happens is when you see them leave good churches, they've always got an excuse. Watch their lifestyle go down. Watch them. Watch their standard go down. Watch everything about them start going down. Now they're blaming somebody else. I tell people, if you leave a good church, you need to at least go to one that's good or better. But when you go to one that's not good or better, then you've gone down with that. But he said this, he said, but we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. He's, he's thanking God for the Red Sea, but I'm going to tell you what you want to thank God for. Thank God if you're saved, He's got your soul in His hand. I thank God for that. He, he holds my soul tonight. He holds it in His hand. He takes care of it. And then He said, and suffers not our feet to be moved. I was talk, preaching a little, a little bit about that this morning, about uh, bending and bowing and burning. Hey, Listen, I want to be standing when the last shot's fired. I want to be on the front line spiritually uh, when I go to my grave. I, I'd love to, I don't want, I used to say I'd, I'd like to die in the pulpit, and then I had somebody say, Preacher, please don't do that. You know, <laughs> yeah, take that thing home. Don't die up here in the pulpit, and I can see them up here just a pumping and, and nobody giving me mouth to mouth. <laughs> You know, when you get when you're preaching, you get gummed up. You know, when you're foaming at the mouth, and they say, "Whoop, no, <laughs> uh, we're just well, you're just in trouble." Amen. But he, he he suffers our foot not to be moved. Over in Isaiah, he said, "When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee." You ever get scared? Now, I'm not talking about shaky, say, shaky, scared. I, I, that's you save that for Halloween. 
But I'm talking about get a fear in your heart because of the way things are going or, or things. Happen. Everybody does that at some time or the other. I've often said, if you don't fear something, you're going to get in trouble down the road. Uh, you've got to have a certain amount of fear. It has to, if nothing else, be a reverential fear, but you've got to have fear. But he said this, he said, They'll not overflow thee when thou walkest through the fire. Thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. So we find that he proved them in the Old Testament by taking care of Egypt and taking them through the Red Sea. But he proves himself in your life the same way. God, God can bring you through impossible situations in your life and you come out on the other side and doing right well. So he has brought us, notice what he said in the last part. He said that he hath brought us, O God, thou hast proved us, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Notice what he said in verse number 11 and 12. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. And we went through fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. So I want to look at something else tonight. Why do you praise the Lord? One, remembering what God's done something for others. That's why I like people to testify sometimes. Just get up and tell what God, if God's done something good for you, stand up and tell them about it. Just tell them, hey, I, I, I've got a testimony. I want, to, I want to tell you what God did for me this week, how God worked something out. But then we find there's a resolve that goes along with it. So I want to look to resolve a little bit longer. You can go 13 down through 20 and find resolve. So I'm going to break this down. What, what does it do? When we remember what he's done there and reflect on what he's doing now, then it ought to do something in our hearts called resolved. In verse number 38, notice what he said, I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. It ought to cause us to have a faithfulness to the things of God. Uh, I love church. Uh, Barbara's bad headache tonight. Had it all afternoon. I had a sick headache and still got the headache. And it rode in the car with her. So she brought that thing. She said, my head ate, ate at church just like it can eat uh, at the house. I, I, I tried to talk her out. I told her two or three times, why don't you just lay in the bed tonight and try to get rid of the headache? She said, no, I'm going to go with him. So we just got up and we came to church together tonight. But faithfulness. Boy, when we see what God has done in doing for us, it ought to cause us to have a faithfulness to God. A faithfulness to Him. So we find our faithfulness, I will go into thy house. And then we find a resolve to sacrifice. He said with burnt offerings. In the Old Testament, we've been going through the offerings in Leviticus. And the burnt offering is one that is totally consumed upon the fire of the altar. They didn't take the blood of that or anything else. They took that, they slew that animal and laid it up there and they burn it until it fell as ashes through the grate into the bottom. It was something that was completely set aside for God. It was completely burnt up for God. So we give to Him not only faithfulness in attendance, but faithfulness in sacrifice tonight. You know what God wants tonight? God wants us to praise the Lord, but not an empty thing. He wants us to praise God with our life. Let your life praise God in itself. It may just, just be a light to people. Be a joy to people. Be a joy to the house of God. Just come in and just totally give yourself over the things of God. And then we find a resolve to be faithful in promise. Notice what he said with verse 14, which my lips, he talks about my vows in verse 13, I'll pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. You ever told God, if you get me out of this, I'll do such and such. Huh? Now let me ask you a question. Did you do what you said you would? In the Old Testament, God calls vowing a vow and not keeping a vow, a sacrifice of fools. God said He'll require that. He said, I'll require that. And you tell God, I'll do this. And you stand before God and I'll do this. 
or I'll do that. When you make that vow to God, you need to be faithful in that vow to God. One thing my dad taught me, and boy, he taught me a lot over the years, but he told me if you make a bad deal, keep it. He said, you, you do what you say that you're going to do. If you're going to tell somebody you're going to do something, if you can't do it, call them up and give them a good reason why. And don't leave them hanging. You ever had somebody leave you hanging? Had somebody coming over for supper one night and Barbara fixed up a great big supper and about, I think, 15 to 30 minutes after supper time and it was still sitting on the table, that individual called from up around Spartanburg somewhere and said, we'll be there in about 45 minutes to an hour. <laughs> did that. You say what it did. Me and Barbara ate supper. Amen. They can have scraps when they get there. <laughs> We're not holding supper that long. But he's talking about keeping a vow tonight. A far, part of our glory and praise to God is when we tell God we're going to do something and do what you say you're going to do. Just keep your vows unto God. Be faithful in your promise. And then be faithful in your testimony. Notice in verse 15, I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices. He goes on down and tells burnt uh, bullocks uh, with goats. But look at verse 16. Come and hear all ye that fear God and I'll declare what he hath done for my soul. Be faithful to tell people what God's doing in your life. Boy, I, I think sometimes when we go uh, visit people and things of that, they, they need to know that God's moving in some areas. And by the way, God is. We live in a bad, bad time, bad place. That, that's okay. God's still saving some folks. God's still saving some folks. Hey, they're going to get fewer and fewer and fewer and you get more people say they got saved and then they don't live like they're saved and uh, just got all kinds. I, I went one time and, and supposedly they led a man to the Lord. Boy, he was faithful as he could be. I baptized him and he never came back to church. Never set his feet back in church again. And I thought, man, what a shame. But faithful in our testimony. What a blessing to hear what God is doing. And then faithful in our worship. Notice what he said in verse number 17. I cried unto him with my mouth and he was extolled with my tongue. Church is not a spectator sport. Church is involvement. That's what, that's what gets the job done in the church. Everybody here ought to be here to be a blessing. You know, one, you ought to be here to be a blessing to God. Amen. Thank God. Then we ought to be a blessing to one another. Then we ought to be a blessing to the church. And if you'll do these things, you'll be a blessing to the people outside the church. But we find faithful in our worship. When we come to the house of God, a lot of times they put on the sign, come worship with us, but nobody worshiped. I don't want to be guilty of not worshiping. I act a little different here at church than I do at home and other things. Why? This is a special place. I, I praise the Lord and sit out there and talk and wave my hands at Him at the house. But here it's different. This, this is a place that is set aside for praising God and for glorifying God. That's what the church is for. So we find faithful in worship. And then we find faithfulness and holiness. Notice what he said in verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Hidden, hidden sin that we keep in our hearts that God knows about, we know about, and we know God knows about it. They'll hinder our prayer life. They'll stop our prayers from getting answered. So we need to be resolved to keep our lives as clean as we can. I struggle just like you struggle. And I tell you that a lot because I put my pants on one leg at a time, my shoes on one shoe at a time. I'm a man. I have my ups and my downs. 28 when I got saved. I'd been down a lot of bad avenues by the time I was 28 years of age. Been around the world. Been uh, just done a whole lot of things. And I thank God that He changed my life. But I carry some baggage with me. You understand what I'm saying? Some of you others have baggage that you carry with you. They are the scars that old Job said a man bears uh, the scars of his youth to his grave, basically. But regarding iniquity, that word regarding means to think much of. 
Something that we hold on to. I believe everybody here tonight has got a besetting sin. You've got something that aggravates you all the time. Something you struggle in an area of your life. It doesn't have to be something that's dirty down someplace else. But there are areas that are where we, we do that. A resolve to be faithful in holiness. And then we find a resolve to be faithful in our prayer. Look what he said. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. I believe a lot of worship starts in your prayer closet. If you pray and, you, and worship God in your prayer closet, you'll, be, you'll have a tendency to do a little bit more worship of God when you get public. I believe private worship, it begets public worship. That's, that's a part of how this thing works. But we find that we're to be faithful in prayer. He said in verse 20, Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. A beautiful psalm about praising God. Why? One, by remembering what God's done back here, and then remembering what God is now doing right now. Listen, God's doing some things in your life and mine. I thank the Lord. Here lately, I've gotten more out of my Bible reading than I have in a long time. It just... I just pray before I open that Bible and just ask God to show me some things that I've never seen before. I'm talking about show me some things out of the Word of God, and He does that. But then it helps us in the area of praise. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of His name and make His praise glorious. Learn to worship God by remembering and reflecting on what God's doing in your life and then resolve to live for Him and you'll find that your praise life will change. It will grow. And then you begin to worship God. Just a beautiful little song. He said, I want to put that thing to music. Uh, we sang this morning, what is that? I will praise Him. I will praise Him. I like those songs that they sing. I love the old songs. I love a hymn book. Not against the newer songs. I thank God there's still some good writers out there. Uh, but at the same time, these are songs that try to help us to praise the Lord when we're in the house of God. Let's stand tonight. We're going to get ready to go back there. Just remember and reflect. God's been good to us. God's taken care of us. God's going to take care of us. And God's going to be good to us. You're going to do that all the way home. If you need to come tonight, you come.